It was strongly suggested to me before the eight o'clock that I include Go Chiefs in this sermon. (laughs) So, Go Chiefs. (laughs) So, we've just come out of the Christmas season. Give or take a few weeks. In case anyone doesn't follow or know about the liturgical calendar, here's how it goes. We have four Sundays of Advent, Christmas, then the first and second Sundays after Christmas, then we have Epiphany, the arrival of the three wise men, and three Sundays after Epiphany, we come to the presentation of Jesus at the temple, and that's today. But what what is this presentation of Christ at the temple all about? One thing this scripture shows us is that Mary and Joseph were devout Jews. They, once again, are found traveling a distance. This time to get to the temple in Jerusalem to present their firstborn son at this temple in accordance to Jewish law. If you remember the story of the Passover, when the Jews were trying to escape out of Egypt and Pharaoh wouldn't let them go. You remember that story? (laughs) A lot of major events occurred in that story, but the one that impacts this presentation was that God virtually took ownership of all firstborn males. The Jewish people were instructed back in the book of Leviticus that they were to perform this ritual. It's a ritual of redeeming the firstborn male back from God. Now our scripture tells us that Mary and Joseph brought two turtle doves as an offering. And just so you know, this is a very humble offering, one which would be given by a poor family of little means. So that's what this is all about. Mary and Joseph, as devout Jews, were obeying the Torah. You see, Though in our Christian tradition, today we know that Jesus is the Christ, Mary and Joseph were just a regular devout Jewish couple bringing their regular Jewish baby boy to the temple to ransom him back from God in accordance to what they learned in the Torah. But maybe I misspoke. Regular Jewish family? Regular baby boy? I mean, just think of what Mary and Joseph had already witnessed about their son. They end up giving birth in a town where they had no family. The only place they could find to sleep ended up being in a barn with a bunch of smelly animals. And then these shepherds show up with stories about angel choruses and a bright star. And then these three guys from the east show up, the same ones who were with us a couple of weeks ago. (laughs) They show up with lavish gifts and more stories about dreams, a newborn king, and bright stars. And scripture tells us that Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. So, I'm sure that Mary and Joseph are just relieved to finally do something which is normal to their traditions. Just go to Jerusalem, go to the temple, and perform this rite in accordance to their good old familiar Jewish law. Well, not quite. But what happens? But this weird old guy comes up and basically takes the baby out of Mary's arms. Now, Scripture tells us, it tells us that, guided by the Spirit, Simeon came into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what was customary under the law, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God. And then the story goes on. Now, just think about it. Many of us have experienced having a precious newborn baby. Everything has to be sanitized. Every surface in your home has been scrutinized. I have a friend, when her newborn was born, he's 40-something years old now, but when he was born, anyone who entered the house had to wash their hands with this, with this prescription soap. <laughs> You can imagine the look of confusion when innocent visitors were, es- were escorted to the bathroom, <laughs> handed a tube of special soap in order to wash their hands thoroughly. Yeah, we still tease her about that to this day. 
But that's just an example of how new parents want things to be so perfect for this new little one. Mary and Joseph, they're going to the temple, and like I said, this elderly gentleman comes up and takes the baby out of Mary's arms. And once again, they hear things about their boy which causes them, I'm sure, to treasure these things in their heart. Basically, Simeon is saying, okay, I can die now because my eyes have seen your salvation, which you promised to me. Even today, think about it. When something extraordinary happens, people will often say, okay, I can die now. Many of you remember our former assistant priest, one of our former assistant priests, Father Marcus Haley. Well, on Twitter, Father Marcus is a force to be reckoned with. (laughs) Always brings a smile to my face. Once when Father Marcus was at a conference, he had preached early in the day, and our presiding bishop, Bishop Curry, was there. Later, when the presiding bishop was speaking, he referenced something Father Marcus had said. Well, never to disappoint, Father Marcus tweeted, I can just go ahead and die now. (laughs) (laughs) The presiding bishop just referenced something I said, and of course he didn't stop there, but he proceeded to plan his own funeral by tweeting, in lieu of flowers, bring lemonade. (laughs) And that's kind of how Simeon felt. He had lived to this ripe old age. We're not told how old he was, just that he was very old. And the day had finally come where he was witnessing in this little baby the salvation of the Lord. I mean, even though it was Jesus, I'm sure he still looked like a regular baby, yet Simeon saw beyond this, way beyond this. He saw not only the salvation and consolation of the Jewish people, but Simeon said that this would also be a light for the revelation to the Gentiles. And that was foresight. And as if this weren't enough, there was an 84-year-old woman there, Anna. She was a prophet, and she also came up to the couple. Scripture tells us at at that moment, she came and began to praise God and to speak about the child to all who were looking for the redemption of Jerusalem. But the question is, what did Simeon see? What did Anna see? With the Christmas story, it spelled out to us what the shepherds saw when the angelic chorus started booming out glory to God in the highest. And with the story of the three wise men, we hear all about the bright star that led them to the Christ child, we are told what they saw. But first, before I kind of get into that, another holiday we've recently acknowledged is Martin Luther King's birthday. While we see all the news footage of the civil rights era, and we see so much that was accomplished as a result of Dr. King's legacy and leadership, what is often forgotten about Dr. King is he was a prophet. And he was a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he was a visionary. On the night before he was assassinated, he told the Memphis audience, I just want to do God's will, and God has allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over, and I've seen the promised land. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Do you ever stop and think, what do people like Martin Luther King, Anna, and Simeon see? What did they see which caused them to make claims that have continued to affect us down through the years and the ages? I think Simeon and Anna were visionaries too. People who are able to see things through the eyes of the Holy Spirit. What a paradox. While this passage is all about the dedication and redemption of a baby, the start of a new family, we are also reminded about the wisdom of the elderly among us. We're reminded loud and clear here that while something new was coming, the older generation had been given a glimpse. And they were able, with their wisdom, insight, and godly depth, 
to see that here embodied in this baby will be one who proclaims the worth of all people in the divine family, regardless of whether they are young, old, rich, poor, black, white, Jewish or Gentile, privileged or oppressed, citizen or immigrant. All are included in the divine family. <clears throat> what did Simeon see when he looked at this baby boy? And what did Anna see when she came upon the scene with Simeon and the baby's parents? What do you see when you look at who Jesus is? With all of his focus on people and religious practices in this book, Luke orients this narrative to the fulfillment of the promise that God is indeed with us. The 40th verse says, and we're going to make it personal. The 40th verse says, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom and the favor of, the, and the favor of God was on him. St. Andrews, may you grow and become strong. May you be filled with wisdom. And may the favor of God rest upon you. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.